called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that, if, that the Pharisees took offense at what they heard when they heard what you said? And he answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has planted, uh, my heavenly Father has planted, has will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are the blind, guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. So one of the constant things we do in my house is I'm trying, we're, Crystal and I try to teach our boys how to eat and not spill, right? They have all these crazy contraptions. I mean, I got buy these special sporks from the store. I get these bibs that have a little pouch here, which none of which they really use, so it doesn't make any difference. Point is, I think we're trying to be pretty smart teaching them how to get that food from the plate to their mouths. Now, I don't know how it is in your house, but I think I'm smart, but the smartest ones in our house are really our dogs, <laughs> who sit right underneath the feet of my youngest, like eyes focused, waiting for something to fall. They have taught them way more about how to successfully get the food from the plate to their mouth than I ever dreamed possible, right? I wish I could sometimes just tell them to go away and stop bothering me, but my, my pubs are right there, and now after hearing this passage, I'm... I agree with one commentator after reading all these readings, the gospel is going to the dogs. So I'm going to let them stay, at least for a little while. But this is a gospel where Jesus becomes the story, where Jesus, he actually embodies what the kingdom of God is. Because in the first part, he takes the law, and he interprets it and transforms it into show to show God's part of the kingdom. And then in the second part, when this woman comes, he actually embodies what he's already talked about. He embodies that transformation within himself. Now, my Wednesday at Wendy's group, we've been studying the book of Matthew, and they've heard me say this before. But Matthew is a particular gospel because the, the first century audience of Matthew is kind of caught in between a shift. They're, they're good Jewish people, used to the old ways of doing things, but they're also hearing and seeing a few things differently in this Jesus. So the good Jew is wondering, well, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to follow this Jesus, or am I supposed to follow the things I have been followed for centuries before that? And so it's written to target that audience. And Jesus, with his very life in this gospel, is speaking to that situation. He becomes the point where things shift. Right? So here we see Jesus take on and embody this parable in a way that he is transformed with the way he sees everything. So that everyone who hears this gospel 
might be transformed in the way they see everything as well. But this Canaanite woman, she embodies God's love for all. It's as if she knows this Isaiah passage that we heard from today with every fiber of her being. It's a part that we often neglect in the Old Testament. From Isaiah 56, that, where it says that these foreigners who join themselves to God, they will be joined on that holy mountain as well, right? Verse 8 says, <clears throat> the Lord who gathers the outcasts of Israel will also gather the others than just them. They will be gathered together. We neglect to read sometimes in the Old Testament that God has a blessing or an inclusion intended for all nations on the horizon. It was the Jews who were supposed to take that to the world and live that out and get enacted by them. And this Canaanite woman, this outsider, she understands that or has heard that in such a profound way that now she comes to Jesus because she says, this is my chance. I know the promise. This is my chance to experience this. Because people who get so caught up in that promise, dear folks, understand that it's about blessing and healing of the world, not just themselves. She says, I have a daughter that you can start with, Jesus. And she will not waver from that promise that she knows to be true. It's a promise of generosity. That heart of God, that's the same promise that we hold to with every fiber of our being. That we are also called to participate in what God is bringing about in this world. Here at Calvary, we like to lift up that we are God's heart with our human hands, right? That's what we like to say, that we bear God's generous heart. That we've been given that. But you bear God's generous heart. Because of that, you have that generosity of spirit within yourself. People of God, you need to know you are important to the work that happens here. This place doesn't grow or doesn't expand. It doesn't even hold the ministries or outreach that you do without you. Without your time. Without you showing up. I mean... I'm the preacher. I'm thankful somebody showed up today. <laughs> because it's by the grace of God that you keep coming. And I recognize that. And I honor that. So it's your time that you give that makes this place go. This place doesn't work without the gifts and talents that you give so that we share together as a community. That we make this world better than it was before. This place doesn't work without your faithful giving of your treasure without you opening up with that generosity that God has given you first. And because of that, it doesn't matter the size of the gift. No gift is insignificant, but it is vital, our responsibility, that we embody that transforming presence that Jesus did, that we live that out. It was part of the Old Testament law. It was what this woman, this Canaanite woman, clung to with her whole self and is what we live by as people of faith today. That's what we're called. That's what we're called to be. I was struck in this Romans reading. I saw something different this week from uh, Romans 11, 32, the last line in there where it says, For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. And I had to look that up because I was like, what is that imprisoned? What does that mean? And I found out it means... Not imprisoned in the sense that God has shut us up behind bars, but it means that God has shut up or enclosed together, right? Like fish caught up in a net together. That's what it means. That God has put us all together so that God, God's mercy would be included for all. So that we could say, where we see in this world, where someone says one race or one people is above another. No, by the grace of God, you're wrong. We are caught up in this together because of God's mercy. Because I know every time I end up putting a nice little neat box around who God is, I find God, God's heart or God's spirit in someone who stands outside of that box. So what am I to do but rely on God's mercy? And I realize we are caught up in this together. I had a, 
I had another aspect of that. This week I was interviewing a pastor for the podcast to hell with the hot dish that I do. Her name was Pastor Marsha Wakeland. She's in Anchorage, Alaska, and she had opened up a, a space in her community called the Listening Post. And it was an open space, inviting the community to come and to either have some quiet time or to have somebody there to listen to them, to help them think through what's going on in their mind. To listen, not to judge, not to fix, not to advise, just to listen. Just listen. It's more than just. But she talked about, as she opened up this community space, how they could listen to countless stories of broken relationships, powerlessness, home, struggling with homelessness, people feeling lost or feeling rejected in their life. And she says, everybody who comes say they felt they were just passed by by society or that they were brushed off or that they were interrupted in any conversation, that they were not heard in society. She said, because we don't take the time, if I want to put it mildly, probably. And she said, we want to give them a space to explore that inner territory within themselves, to hear what God is saying to them, what God might be doing through them. And we want to offer somebody to listen so that in that moment where they are heard, that just for a moment they would realize they were a person. Not someone burdened, not someone alone, not someone homeless, not some whatever. Because in that relationship of two people, it creates a nest that holds us together. We are caught up in this together. And she said, I remain convinced that when we listen deeply beyond our own need of being heard, beyond the rustle of our own concerns, there are no strangers in the heart. That when we can truly listen, support each other, we slowly, through the sweep of love, become each other. Dear friends in Christ, that... <laughs> I can't say the gospel better than that. God, who in Christ, through God's love, becomes one of us. <clears throat> becomes us. To suffer the cross. To bring the resurrection. So that we could discover the depth that there are no strangers in God's love. That God is working in us, through us, and with us to transform this world and to carry that message. So I... I cling to that promise with every fiber of my being that God will grant us courage and the grace sufficient to meet the challenges that face us in life, in community, in the way we live. Because we stand together and we stand with the other. It's there that we encounter God. It's there we meet God at this table where we become strengthened as we are fed with that promise. And that power creates in us the ability to be able to do what God wants us to do, to live that kingdom of God. So maybe we try to be like this woman who didn't retreat in silence, but who spoke out, and who did something, who offered something to change the world. So I think maybe, maybe the wisest act in all of this, <laughs> this Sunday, is that we just throw it all out. To the dogs. Thanks be to God.